everybody. Hi, friends. Welcome, Welcome. to another quarantine episode of I'm Horrified. Yep, another quarantine episode. Um, we are not going to have a normal episode today, um, but it is, it is, well, it's continued to not be a normal time. It's not a yeah. normal time because we're doing quarantine episodes, but um, today we really want to talk about um, what's going on in the world, not just because of our subject matter that we cover, but we feel like that's the conversation that's happening right now. And it's a conversation that needs to be happening on so many different levels <laughs> with so many different types of conversation. And, and that's what we do here with you guys. Um, Sam and I have talked about, um, you know, what's been happening in the world. We've been talking about it with our families, with our friends, and it only makes sense for us to have this conversation with you guys too. So we're going to be talking today about, um, <laughs> how do you put it about about racism about police yeah. brutality about systemic injustice mm -hmm. that's what we're going to be talking about today yeah um so we we have some things we put together for you guys but i i also wanted to and um we both speak for each other today yeah. <laughs> um, we've we've talked a lot about how we want to we want to talk today um uh, but we also wanted to give some context as to like, why are we having this conversation? Why two white women are talking about racial injustice? Um, we are certainly not knowledge sources, <laughs> um, or perspective sources, but, um, right now, um, there is a lot of suffering in the world. Um, black Americans are suffering right now at the hands of government and police system and systemic issues with racism that have always caused suffering for Black Americans. Um, and our role as white people, white women, non-Black people of color is to acknowledge that, educate ourselves, amplify the voices of Black Americans and their experiences right now. And, you know, what's been happening for years and years and years Thankfully, <laughs> there seems to be something different about this current moment, mm -hmm. um, but it is not without absolutely a lot of bloodshed and suffering. So our job right now is to open our ears <laughs> as much as our hearts and our wallets. Um, and uh, I, I think what I want to hammer home personally is this isn't, what, what I understand um, is that this is something that we need to do not just in a reactive manner, um, where we're reacting to tragedy, but in a proactive manner as well, um, integrating contributions to systemic change into a monthly, daily, weekly basis. Um, and there's a couple ways that we have to do that that we're going to talk about. Um, and the other thing that I think talking is white to white ladies, which also could be the name of our podcast, which really is could probably the name of a lot of podcasts to white <laughs> ladies problem um, is that I we have refrained from posting on our socials right now other than our personal socials um and we're definitely going to start posting we're going to be posting this episode and resources and trying to open up a conversation for those who are ready to have it with us this for white people is not the time to be posting your frustration overwhelm you know F the police, F white people. If you're a white person, <laughs> absolutely like lift up the voices of black Americans who are feeling those feelings. But our job is to support and to uplift and to take action, not just to be angry without, without a direction and wait for somebody to give us marching orders. It's time for us to try to, um, it's, it's high time <laughs> for you know white Americans not to just react, but to activate and to take action. Absolutely. Yeah, so in the interest of that, today we're going to be sharing some resources with you guys and voices that we've been listening to and that have helped us kind of figure out where we're at at this journey and have impacted us and that need to be shared. Uh, and we really welcome you guys to contribute any resources um, 
that you've found really helpful to you, we'll obviously be like tweeting this episode out. And we'd love for you guys to respond to the episode, tell us the stuff that's been helping you, give us more people to follow and more, you know, voices for us to listen to. Um, and I'll make sure, we'll, we'll both make sure that all of the citations of the stuff that we talk about today are in these episode notes mm -hmm. and in the YouTube yep. notes. So anything we talk about today, you'll be able to click on very easily. Um, and change is something that's accomplished by people making individual choices on a community level. So we want to make sure that our community, you guys, are fully embracing equality and putting in the work to try to make an equal world for everyone. And that starts with just opening your ears, listening to the things that people are saying and, and doing your part here. So. Yeah, for sure. So we're going to give you guys some quotes that have been speaking to us. We're going to give you some resources, some education sources, and then some, some next steps that you can take. So that's, that's the menu for this episode. That's what we're giving out. Um, so I'll start with a couple of quotes that I've been thinking about um, and uh, they're both from women of color, um, black women. Um, and the first one is from Ijeoma Luo, um, and she wrote, um, so you want to talk about race, which I think is on our book list, is it? <laughs> I, think <it's> <laughs> I think it is. Um, it's fantastic. I highly recommend it if you're looking for further reading, which a lot of us are. Um, and she says in her book, uh, disadvantaged white people are not erased by discussions of disadvantages facing people of color just as brain cancer is not erased by talking about breast cancer. They're two different issues with two different treatments and they require two different conversations. Um, hopefully you can understand also how that applies to the concept, the misguided concept of all lives matter. Um, there's, yeah, we don't, <laughs> we're, well, if, you, if you actually have any questions about why that is not an appropriate thing to say at this time, please DM me, I'll, I'll, we can have a conversation about that. Yes, 100%. Um, my, the other quote that I was looking at was by um, Monroe, Monroe Bergdorf on Instagram. She is a model and she um, is also an activist and she was dropped from L'Oreal Paris for speaking out about racial injustice following um, George Floyd's murder. And uh, she, I, I'm so glad that a spotlight was put on that. <laughs> she is now being, you know, given the respect that she deserves um, for her thought leadership. And she just has some really incredible things to say. And this really oh, it was very enlightening for me. She says, racism is not a black people problem. It is a white cultural issue. In order to push forward, we need to shift the perspective of oppression being the problem of those who experience it. We need to, we need to acknowledge that privilege exists as a spectrum and is an indicator for where work needs to take place. Expecting marginalized folk to be the ones to deconstruct their own oppression is as good as saying that's not my problem and letting it happen, as it doesn't acknowledge where the problem is coming from. The definition of privilege is thinking that something isn't a problem because it isn't your problem. So that sums it up, <laughs> especially from our perspective for this episode is, you know, we, we realize that not all people listening to this are white, um, but a lot of people listening to us are. <laughs> yeah. And I think it's, it's very important for us to be speaking to other white women, other white people and saying, this is the way we should be shifting our perspective. These are the tools we have, not looking to our, you know, black friends, peers, loved ones to do that work. Absolutely. Um, and then here's a couple quotes that have been resonating with me. Um, so the first one, uh, that has really hit me these last couple weeks are, um, in a racist society, it is not enough to be non-racist. We must be anti-racist. And that is from Angela Davis, who has been like an activist in the community for a really, really long time. Angela Davis. <laughs> yeah. And mostly just, I wanted yes. to make sure I had a quote by her so I could say her name. So I could say, please go and look at her history, look at her thoughts on things. She has been doing this work for a really long time, and she really knows what she's talking yeah. about. This work is there. I mean, Angela Davis, Bell Hooks, Jane yeah. Baldwin, like there's so, there's so much, it, it, and it's so upsetting that the, the work and labor of deconstructing these things has been so brilliantly constructed over so long a time, and still this is the, this is the world that we, that we are in. 
Yeah, 100%. So Google her. Um, but then this next one is from an essay, or I think it's actually like a whole book that's often like quoted in essay form, um, but it's uh, called White Privilege, Unpacking the Invisible Knapsack. Uh, and it's by a woman named Peggy McIntosh. Um, and she is a white lady and she does a lot of scholarship in like feminism. And she kind of had this like realization that like much like men can't see their male privilege, white people cannot see their whiteness privilege. So she wrote right. this essay that I see quoted a lot um, kind of as people start to go on this journey of like, oh, I have to examine my biases. Mm -hmm. um, so she said, and just like a foundational bit of this essay is, to redesign social systems, we need to first acknowledge their colossal unseen dimensions. The silences and denials surrounding privilege are the key political tool here. They keep the thinking about equality or equity incomplete, protecting unearned advantage and conferred dominance by making these subjects taboo. So like, right. that's why we're talking about it today. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's a great taboo. perspective. Yeah, so. Re you can find that essay, like, if you just Google white privilege unpacking the invisible knapsack, you can find that essay anywhere. So mm -hmm. check that out if you're looking for, for that. Um, but next up, we wanted to give you guys uh, a couple of resources that you can use if you want to start kind of doing this work and you're looking for, like, okay, what can I do? Mm -hmm. so first up is we're going to go, also, I wanted to just say for your brain, sometimes it's helpful for my brain. We're going to go three, two, one. We're going to mm -hmm. go three, three aggregators, three, two essays, one petition, three books, two movies, one podcast. We're going to just kind of break it down so, so you can bite it and we will have all this information for you in a couple different places. Absolutely. Um, so starting off three action aggregators. Um, so obviously going on blacklivesmatter.com and their website is a really helpful place to go. Um, specifically the place that I found really, really helpful, and I'm just going to read out the link, but again, this will be linked kind of in your description notes, is blacklivesmatter.carrd.co. So like blacklivesmatter.card.co. Right. Um, and that has been a really great aggregator of um, petitions to sign, places to donate, like ways to donate directly to protesters, ways to donate directly to the families of people who are victims of police brutality, um, updated like places that are no longer asking for donations because they've gotten so many, which is such a wonderful mm -hmm. thing that's happening. Um, and so I literally go and check that website like every couple days to see like what's, what's new, what's going on. Yeah. Um, I found it really, really helpful. Um, the second one is defund12.org. Um, and that is a website that is all about um, defunding the police and kind of reallocating those resources to social services and other things in like a community way that can be helping with these problems. Um, there's a lot of really interesting articles about that. But the great thing about Defund 12 is that they have everything broken down by like city. So you can usually just kind of scroll to your city or your area and you click a button and there's like an email for you already written to yeah. send to your local mayor or city council. So it's really easy, really actionable. Um, and you learn a lot even as you read the email that they drafted for you. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> like, I did that earlier today. And as I was reading the email, I was like, I'm so glad I'm sending this email. Uh, Cause you, it gave me like eight new things to Google. Um, and the last one is a Google sheet and it's called resources and tools regarding racism and anti-blackness and how to be a better ally. Um, and that's compiled by Tatum Durrell, Jordan Durrell, and Matt Herndon. And it's massive. It's like, imagine a giant spreadsheet. It's got pages and pages of like books to read, movies to watch, and then like, as you keep scrolling, petitions to sign, mm -hmm. places to donate, things you can do today. It's really, really helpful. And again, they're keeping it super updated. Yeah. So that's been very helpful. Links below. Uh, two essays that you can check out that we would recommend checking out right now. Um, there's one called 70 things, 75 things white people can do for Rachel Just Rachel Justice? Oh my. Um, for 75, Rachel Justice. <laughs> yes. 75 things white people can do for racial justice. And that's by Corinne Shuttuck and it's an essay on medium. Yeah, but, you showed you showed me that one. And that one was really, really eye-opening. Yeah. And the, the crazy thing about that one is that it again, like it's been updated, but she wrote that in 2017. So these have been things that- Oh, I didn't even, see, I didn't yeah. even catch up on that. And exactly, it seems so present of like, call your city council and see where your, their funding is, you know, all of that stuff that we're all yeah. talking about right now. 
But again, like people have been trying to do this work for a really long time. Yeah. But again, it's really, really approachable, really actionable essay there. Um, and then an essay called How Do We Change America? And that's by um, Kianga Yamada Taylor, um, who has written a couple books on the subject. But that's a really interesting essay about kind of contextualizing what's going on right now in America amongst all of the stuff that's happened before, protests that have happened before, like kind mm -hmm. of our history. And I found that putting that in what's going on now in that context was really, really helpful for me. Yeah. Yeah. And very important if it's not something that you have to live with all the time. Like if it's not something that you as a white person are forced to be reckoning with all the time. Yeah. You need to educate yourself about that. 100%. Um, and then finally, one petition to sign. Um, so we're going to link the NAACP's Justice for Joy George Floyd petition. Uh, there's a few George Floyd petitions going around. Sign any and all of them that you want to. Uh, this one specifically from the NAACP is demanding appointment of an independent special prosecutor to lead an investigation into this murder. And it's also demanding sweeping police reform and federal legislation to make that happen. Right. Um, and obviously everyone knows about the NAACP. They've been doing this work for forever. So yeah, highly recommend. Again, signing a petition is something you can do and feel good about that is really quick, really easy and, and yeah. makes a difference. Yeah, and the NAACP, I think, is also on our list somewhere um, yeah, for- to donate. To donate, yeah. yeah. Oh, yep, we'll get there. Sam will tell us about that later. A teaser um, later. So I have some, some media, some education tools um, here for um, a little bit of narrative, a little bit of narrative education. Um, three books, two movies, one podcast. Um, so the three books we chose, so many good books out there, so many good books being highlighted. Um, uh, first one is, again, I'm going to say, so you want to talk about race by Adrienne Waluo. Also, I recommend following her everywhere. She is amazing, an amazing resource. Um, and it's great, just kind of, um, uh, breaks down how we discuss race in America. Um, the other book that I wanted to recommend is, uh, The New Jim Crow by Michelle Alexander. This is one that you have probably heard of. Um, and I think, uh, this is, this is probably the one I would recommend the most <laughs> out of any book. If you're going to read one book per personally, I would personally recommend you read the New Jim Crow the most. Um, yeah, because it's about, it's about, it's called the New Jim Crow mass incarceration in the age of colorblindness. Um, and it's about the history of mass incarceration, the history of, you know, jailing, um, men of color, the history of drugs and people of color and punitive punishment and things like that. And um, it will completely change your perspective on how you view race in America, um, no matter, you know, no matter how, how much information you may have as a white person. It's, it's a huge, a huge perspective shift, which is wonderful. Uh, and then the third one um, is actually <laughs> the only thing I think I'm recommending that's not written by a person of color. It's called White Fragility. Um, it's one that I know that you you had mentioned that you were um, ordering Sam. Yeah. Um, and I wanted I wanted to include this one um, because it it seems like it has a lot of <laughs> good tools in it for investigating your own biases, investigating whiteness, investigating the first places we go. I, I really just think that there is, there's so much work to do and there's, there is, I think, some benefit in thinking about the macro and the micro. What can we do and what can you do? And sometimes the, the we do is really overwhelming and there's only so much we can do and there's only so much you can do to change the government, um, but there is a lot you can do with how you live your life. And I think that's really important also for white people to be having those conversations together with each other at the dinner table, at Thanksgiving and all that kind of stuff. So investigating fragility, not asking people of color to come in and do that work themselves, <laughs> which is an exhausting, an exhausting practice. Absolutely. And um, it's like the quote you said earlier from Monroe Bergdorf that racism mm -hmm. is a white people problem. So it's exactly to us. This to is our work. <laughs> yeah. 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 We're not helping people of color with their work. We're not helping black Americans with their work. It, this is our work that we need to do. Mm -hmm. um, so two movies. Um, one, first one, um, 
is I Am Not Your Negro. And this is, I loved this film. I saw this when it came out, I think it was last year. It's about um, basically the um, sort of the life and times and writings of, um, and the, the politics of James Baldwin, who, if you are unfamiliar with his writing, I truly think he's the greatest writer who ever lived. <laughs> I truly think he is, is the, is the greatest writer who ever lived, um, who writes about humanity, not just blackness, though he writes about, you know, being a black man in America, amazingly, but he is also, that's it, <laughs> the greatest writer who ever lived. Um, and uh, it's a fantastic documentary that gives, again, a lot of perspective into whiteness and blackness in America, how they meet, where they meet, what what has happened with those two concepts um, over the the last couple hundred years? Um, so I highly recommend that. That is also a great jumping off point for conversations um, about kind of bringing history into the now. They do a really good job with that, kind of bringing those two pieces together. Um, so it's a good jumping off point. Maybe if you don't really know how to start a conversation, watch that movie together. That's a really, if you don't know how to start a conversation with your mom, your partner, a friend of yours, like that would be a great place to start. And it's really well done. And it's something I think, I think films and movies and TV shows and all that kind of stuff, they're great entry points for conversation. Um, the other movie is 13th by Ava DuVernay. Um, and she, uh, she made this movie, she, she directed it. I was like, did she just produce it? No, she directed it. So, um, and this film just it, it ex explores um, mass incarceration in the United States and the insane <laughs> amount, like disproportion of black Americans who are incarcerated in the prison system in America and how um, similarly to the new Jim Crow discusses similar themes about you know, how the prison system affects Black Americans so much more than white Americans. Um, all right, one podcast. It's not ours. <laughs> it's, uh, it's Code Switch. Um, Sam, do you want to tell us a little bit about Code Switch? I love Code Switch. Code Switch know, um, is, is great. And it's so entertaining, too. Yeah. On top of everything else. Yeah, so Code Switch is an NPR podcast. Um, and it's hosted by Gene Demby and Shereen Marisol Miraji. Um, and basically it's like mission statement is just telling stories about people of color for people of color by people of color, um, which is great. Um, but it is often focused on like the experience of being a black American and everything that comes with. And lately they've done a couple like really affecting episodes, obviously with everything going on um, about what's been going on. Um, but as I always find with NPR podcasts, they're like totally engrossing you learn so much. You love the people telling the stories. Like, I don't know what it is about an NPR podcast, but like all of a sudden, like you hear one story from someone and you're like, I'm in love with Gene Denby. Like yep. something about <laughs> the way they speak is like, so I don't know what it is. I'm like that with every NPR host I listen to, but Gene Denby and Shereen Marisol Miraji, I love them. Yeah, something's in the water <laughs> over there for sure. It's it's a very human, um, very sincere yeah. um, show. And um, for those of you who don't know what code switching is, um, so the, the name code switch is based off of the kind of um, linguistic phenomenon is what it says on the Wikipedia page, because I just pulled the Wikipedia page. And it's about um, how a lot of Black Americans have to like move between different, um, you know, uh, sort of sets of language to basically please different sets of people in a country that is more difficult for Black Americans than for white Americans. Demby says, um, many of us subtly reflexively change the way we express ourselves all the time. We're hopscotching between different cultural and linguistic spaces and different parts of our own identities, mm -hmm. sometimes within a single interaction. So yeah. that gives you kind of a concept of where they're coming from. Definitely yeah, recommend. They, they tell a, a big variety of stories, but it's they're all so well done and so informative. And yeah. I really recommend listening to it. Yeah, definitely. Um, so we are coming to the end. So stick with us for just a couple more minutes, guys, because um, we just want to talk about some next steps. Um, if you are a listener of our show, and if you if you like us, if you trust us, we ask that you do these things with us. We will be doing them. Um, we ask that you join us in doing these things. Um, and we're gonna do another three, two, one. We love a three, two, one. It's it's we love it. It's 
you know. <laughs> Um, three is three people. We, we really are going to ask you, I'm going to hold myself to this as well, Sam. I'm sure you will too. Um, choose three people in your life who you have not had a dialogue with about the current events happening right now, about racial injustice, about over-policing, about defunding police. Choose three people in your life who you can start to set the foundations for to have a dialogue with about race in America, about racial injustice, about blackness in America, about whiteness in America, about white fragility. You know, um, I think it's really, this is, we keep saying the work, which is like, there is a lot of work to do and that can seem really, really vague. That's, that's a huge part of it is, is my understanding is a lot of it is going to be Yes, absolutely protest when you can, absolutely donut when you can, absolutely get politically engaged. But if you are doing all of that and not able to engage with the people in your life who trust or care about you, about where their actions may be hurting others, we are not doing the work. Does that make, does that make sense to everyone? <laughs> um, yep. So, so that's, I'm gonna hold myself to that. Does it have to be all right at once? Just set, take, take the, um, the movies, the resources, send the, send the essays that we, you know, that we have for you, send them to people, start a conversation. Um, even if you don't really know where to start, you will figure it out um, and we'll get through it together and, and DM us if you, if you have any questions about, <laughs> if you need some help, let's, let's help each other out. Um, one thing I also want to talk about quickly in terms of starting dialogues is um, a, uh, a mentor of mine, um, Carol Ann Penny, um, who is a fantastic career coach in my circle. She, she posted something the other day about the ring theory of grief, and that's not usually applied to global phenomenon, but she kind of applied it, and it made a lot of sense to me in terms of um, where you put your anxiety when it comes to tragedy <laughs> because there's a lot of people experiencing tragedy right now and you may be really upset i am of course furious and horrified on a daily basis but the, the rule of ring theory the ring theory of grief is comfort in dump out and so you can think of this world right now as these like kind of rings inside of each other the in the inner rings are the people who are experiencing the trauma experiencing the devastation and outside is their immediately fa immediate family members all that kind of stuff outside of that is their community outside of that is their larger community etc so we are on the outskirts right now as white people we're on the outskirts of that grief so we put our comfort in we put our comfort our resources our energy in to support black americans to support other people of color to support people who are disenfranchised and we look for support from our circle and out, <laughs> right? Um, so I'm gonna look to my outer circle, parents, you know, other white friends to, to, to go to them and say, fuck, I'm exhausted, I am scared, I'm tired, I'm angry, all that kind of stuff. But when it comes to, cause it happens, um, but we have to find a way to support our stamina through <laughs> the work that needs to be done. And then, all right. So we, that's three, two follows. We're gonna make two follows right now. We're gonna ask you to go follow two people. Yes, two great follows. Um, so mine is um, an awesome woman. Her name is Rachel Cargill and she's at Rachel Cargill on Twitter. That's R-A-C-H-E-L-C-A-R-G-L-E. Um, and she is a public academic, a writer, a lecturer, and her activism uh, is really rooted in like intellectual discourse and tools and resources that explore the intersection of race and womanhood. Um, and so she has like a really active community on Twitter where she's always like posting interesting questions, getting conversations started. Um, if you follow her, or if you support her on Patreon, she does this um, like weekly, basically seminar series called um, The Great Unlearn. And they're mm. talking about like <laughs> everything that's going on today and all the work that we have to be putting in. Uh, to change the systems that are like so entrenched in this country. Uh, and she's also the founder of the Loveland Foundation, um, which I recently started supporting and it uh, provided, it provides free therapy to black women and girls. Um, and as a person who therapy has impacted me in a really wonderful, helpful way, 
um, I think it's a really, really worthy cause. Um, and she, that, that foundation started because for her birthday, she did a fundraiser, just like as a one-time thing. And it was so successful. And there was such an outcry for the need for mental health services for Black women and girls that an entire foundation has sprung up around this work. So oh, she's wow. really awesome. Highly recommend you go and follow. Yes. So definitely follow her on Twitter. Does she have Instagram too? Yeah, she has Instagram too. I think there she's like Rachel E. Cargill. Okay. Um, yeah, so I've got an, uh, that, yeah, but she, I know she does a lot of her thought leadership on Twitter. Mm -hmm. um, here's one that's mainly for Instagram. I think she, she mostly does her work on Instagram. Layla F. Saad. Um, she is a writer, speaker, podcast host, New York Times bestseller, Renaissance woman. Love that. Um, she wrote Me and White Supremacy, which is another book on that that can be up on that book list um and she has a lot of wonderful insight just a good thing to have um and you know she's got a great grasp of aesthetics she's an aesthetically beautiful instagram as well so but it's um it's important to have that on all of your feeds just to kind of keep that that learning alive to keep that kind of always going um one uh uh in her little blurb it has a quote from her recent instagram post white people let black people rest she says do what rihanna said and pull up get out of our dms get out of our comment sections get out of your philosophizing get out of your comfort zones get in the streets and demand justice so that's Layla Saad and rachel cargill um wow. and lastly we are going to ask if you can to make one donation and where are we asking you send that donation sam um, today, we are asking you to send your donation uh, to the NAACP's Legal Defense Fund. So we talked a little bit about the work that the NAACP has been doing for a <laughs> very long time, uh, at, a little bit earlier in the podcast, but specifically their Legal Defense Fund. It's the country's like first civil and human rights law firm. Like They were doing this work first. It was founded in 1940 by Thurgood Marshall, who was later the first African-American U.S. Supreme Court Justice. Uh, so their resume is pretty good. Uh, <laughs> basically, um, like they are the people on the forefront of trying to change laws and get due process for people who aren't getting, you know, from the legal system what they should be getting. Um, and it's their mission is to achieve racial justice, equality, and an inclusive society. Um, and they're just doing really, really great work. So I would highly recommend donating to them. And then can I put on my fundraiser hat for one second? Please. It just occurred to me to say this. Um, I'm a f I am work in fundraising, guys. I don't know if you know that. She's a fundraising um, profesh. That's what I do. I used um, to be. I'm retired. <laughs> she's retired. Um, if this is a moment where you're being moved to give and you can't give, that's amazing. And you should, as you can, obviously. Um, I would encourage you to consider if you're thinking about like, man, I really want to give $100 in the next month. Think about giving that as $10 a month going forward to the organizations that matter to you. Think about those recurring donations. Um, you feel them less on your wallet so you can potentially give more of them. Like I know if 20 bucks leaves my account every month, 10 to one organization, 10 to another, I don't really feel it. I don't think about yeah. it as much. I'm blessed in that way. Um, and they can then be writing that money continuously into their budget. So when, unfortunately, this stuff leaves the headlines, which I hope it never does, but we've seen the patterns before where there's a big outcry and then everyone goes, it's great, we solved racism. Yeah. And kind of... <laughs> It we, hope it stays, we hope it stays in the headlines until it's not in the headlines for the right reason. <laughs> yes, exactly. Um, when these one-time donations kind of trickle off, if you're yeah. giving monthly support, they can continue to count you in their budget and continue to do the work they're doing for longer, knowing that your $10 a month is going to keep coming in. So obviously, only if you're able, only if that makes sense for you fiscally, but I would encourage you to, to check off that little recurring donation thing when you make a donation. Yeah. Fundraiser hat off. That's a great point, Sam. That's a really great point. And that's part of, like what we said at the beginning, making this a consistent part of your lifestyle. Yeah. Um, which is super important. Um, that, is, that is all we have to say for today. Um, we... Uh, we will still be bringing you content. Um, we will still be talking about racial injustice. Um, we'll have conversations about how we want to keep that conversation moving in our own community. We will open up this conversation on our Twitter at I'm Horrified Pod if you want to come talk with us there. 
we are available um, at I'm horrified podcast at gmail.com. Um, we, we love you all. Um, we know how much suffering is happening in the world right now. And we are very privileged at the very least to be together in yeah. this and together in our, our demand and, um, and need for justice. Mm -hmm. Um, so, so that's, that's all we have today. Um, and we thank you. If you made it this far, we thank you so much. (laughs) Um, and, uh, and we'll be back, we'll be back next week with you. So be well, everyone. Be well.